Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started with our webinar today. Hopefully everybody is excited and looking forward to hearing about the Fostering Higher Education pilot and some of the exciting work that's happened since the last time that we were able to share about this work. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Eileen. Thank you so much, Maddie. I'm Eileen Berman. I'm with the Annie Casey Foundation, and I'm delighted to be with you today talking about the fire fostering higher education program. Um, I invite you to, as we're getting started, drop your name, organization, and location into the chat so we can see who's here with us today. Next slide, please. Um, today's agenda, which I'll share with you here, will start with a little bit of project background. We'll hear more about the fostering higher education program itself. Um, our program developer will share with us some of the lessons from the early pilot study in Southwest Washington. And then we'll hear about the current study that's happening in Georgia and Iowa and hear from our partners in those locations. And there'll be time to ask questions and provide some reflection and feedback at the end of our time together. I'm thrilled to be presenting this work on behalf of the NE Casey Foundation. And the Casey Foundation is represented by myself. I'm a senior associate in our evidence-based practice group. My colleague, Catherine Lester, is the associate director of our family well-being strategy group. And Maddie Day will be serving as our moderator for today's session. And she's also playing a key role in the development of the fostering higher ed approach. Amy Salazar, who is an associate professor at Washington State University, is a lead developer of the program. And we're thrilled that Amina Wellens from Georgia, who is a Jim Casey Initiative partner, and Claire, Claire Dieter from Iowa, who is another Jim Casey Initiative partner, both of whom are delivering this program and testing it in their respective locations, will share with us their experience and be able to respond to any questions you have at the end of the session. Next slide. So the Casey Foundation, as you all know, is committed to helping all young people thrive by 25 with a particular emphasis on youth and young adults. By working with young people ages to 14, 24, we want to ensure that they and their young children have the relationships, supportive communities, as well as the schooling and work opportunities that they need to achieve their dreams. And the fostering higher education model, next slide, which we'll be discussing today, is one of the promising approaches we're developing and testing with partners who you'll hear from shortly. FHE incorporates best practices in youth engagement, cultural competence, and education support to help young people on their post-secondary trajectories. And we're currently testing the model with an eye towards scaling the approach across the Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative sites and well beyond. And we're thrilled that there's so many of you here today who are doing this work. So not only does the development of the fostering higher education model drawn a partnership with practitioners and researchers. It also represents a partnership across the foundation between Casey's evidence-based practice group where I sit and the family well-being strategy group that Catherine will describe. Our evidence group's interest in building solutions to address gaps in the field led us early on to a collaboration with researchers in Washington State, including Amy Salazar, when they first began to develop and test this model locally. And soon after we included our Jim Casey initiative partners to begin to apply these lessons and further strengthen the model. The evidence-based practice group, our work helps to take promising solutions to scale. And the way we do that is by beginning with a pro strong program design, so solidifying what a program hopes to accomplish and how. We support measurement to track progress and understand if the approach is getting desired results. We also recognize that as solutions expand to new locations, they may need to be tailored to different populations, cultures, and contexts. And we're thinking even early on, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, about what 
can help spread an approach and what evidence and data will help make the case for the investment and policy changes that are necessary for more extensive scale. Though we're early in our FHG journey, we've already learned a great deal, and I'm excited to be sharing the FHG story and practices with all of you today. And I'll turn now to my colleague, Catherine. Awesome. Thanks, Eileen. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be with you for this FHG conversation. Again, my name is Catherine Lester, and I work uh, within the Family Wellbeing Strategy Group, which is the unit responsible for Casey's child welfare portfolio. In 2021, when we began to really hold this focus around well being within our child welfare work, um, it meant that we needed to get really clear about our North Star. And so you can see on this slide um, in the box at the top, this is what we think of as our North Star, our population result. Uh, we are really kind of thinking about our contributions as moving towards ensuring that all children and young people birth through 26, as well as their families are safe, healthy, and equipped to thrive together in a just and equitable community, um, and to do so without unnecessary child welfare system involvement. And just like probably many, many of you on this call, think about data all the time, so do we. Um, we considered a lot of data when we were thinking about like our work and sort of how did we wanna move in a way that really sort of turned curves. Uh, for young people and their families. And so there are three things often thought of as indicators that we landed on as sort of how we wanted to structure our focus. Uh, we believe that it's important to move the needle around rates of entry, uh, rates of permanency, and rates of disconnection. And I wanted to share this kind of context about Casey's child welfare work because I think it's important when we begin to look at how does the FHE pilot really fit within that. So if we move to the next slide, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the strategies that we believe are really important to getting to our North Star. As you can see, there are a number of what we think of as our legacy strategies, as well as emergent strategies that we think are critical um, in terms of our contribution in this work. The leg and both are really important. So the legacy strategies are things that we have been doing for a while that have had impact, and they have been really important to inform the things that are more emergent to meet the moment that we're in right now. And I wanna talk a little bit about sort of two points, one around legacy and one around emergent work. Um, first, I wanna acknowledge the Jim Casey Initiative. This is a two decade partnership with a national network. And it was uh, really this network that was leveraged for the identification and invitation to expansion sites for the Fostering Higher Education pilot. Uh, you're going to hear more from both Georgia and Iowa, as well as sort of like hear about what's been happening to date. Um, this initiative also brought a really sharper focus around two best practices that we often think about within the family well-being strategy group. One is around uh, equity and inclusion, and the second is around authentic youth engagement. And you're going to hear more about both of those best practices in today's presentation as well. And then secondly, I want to acknowledge one of our emergent strategies. So it's the very last one on the right side of this slide. And that's really about creating a culture of well-being that promotes uh, connections to school, work, and other opportunities for older youth who've experienced care. We're currently engaged in a lot of kind of testing, active testing and learning around what would it take to support this culture of well-being that advances connections for young people. And the Fostering Higher Education Pilot is one of those test and learn activities. And so I'm just really excited about what we are discovering real time through this partnership and how that can inform our future thinking and strategy as we move forward. So again, thrilled to be in this conversation with you all and just as thrilled to hand off to my friend and colleague, Maddie Day. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. So um, now we are going to do a little bit of a, an interactive time. So we want to hear from you all. Um, we know that you wouldn't have joined us today if you didn't have a little bit of interest in um, post-secondary success for young people. So we would love for you to join us at slido.com. And you can either use your phone, scan the QR code that you see on the screen, or you can enter in the number that you see on the screen. Um, at slido.com and note that there is a space between the five and the zero. 
And um, the question that we have is what helps young people most in preparing for post-secondary success? So the um, poll should be live and we will go to it in just a second. I'll take this down and you'll still be able to, to use the QR code, but you can start entering in your responses right now. Okay, oh. oh, there we go. All right, it looks like we have some responses already and I will share my screen. Wonderful, oh, excellent. So we're seeing a lot of financial support, relationships, supportive connections, mentorship, consistent supports, relational supports. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Okay. So supportive relationships seems to be a big one. Thanks, everybody, for participating with us. We love to, you know, get these answers and really kind of see where people are thinking. And I think some of your responses will um, be very nicely aligned with some of the learning that we've done through FHE over the last couple of years. So I'm seeing financial support also coming strong, um, supportive adults, social emotional learning coaching, scholarships, and please definitely feel like, feel free to keep them coming. We can keep this going for a little bit longer just so that we get all of the, all of the good answers. Okay. And coaching is coming through. Just so you know, the way that these work is the bigger they, um, the answers are, the more frequently people are entering them in. So I'm seeing access come forward. And I see caring adults present, trusted support, security, basic needs, housing, hope. That's a great one. Oh, yeah, housing is becoming a big one. I see that. Wonderful. All right, yeah, looks like housing is, is right now our most prominent answer. And we'll just give a couple more seconds to get a few more in here. But I love seeing the diversity and also just that a lot of these really center around how young people are engaging with other folks and those trusted adults, those supportive adults. Um, and you know what really comes through strong is just how important that social capital is to be able to be connected. So I just want to say thank you all so much uh, for taking a minute. I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen and we will go back to, um, to our presentation. It's always a little bit of a toggle. But here we go. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Amy Salazar. I'm associate professor at, at WSU. Um, and I uh, led the creation of the Fostering Higher Education program. Um, so thanks for joining in with us today to learn a little bit about where we are. Um, so I'm going to start us off today talking a little bit about the background of the fostering higher ed study. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, as I'm sure everyone here um, knows, because there's probably um, good reason that all of you are deciding to join this today because you're at least a little bit familiar with this area of work. Um, Post-secondary access and completion can be challenging for youth with foster care experience for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of the things that you all are reflecting in the in the word cloud that we were just looking at can can be can be real barriers um, to both accessing and being um, successful in completing higher ed for youth who have been in care. Um, and uh, it's it's actually a little kind of hard to collect data on exactly where we're at in terms of uh, post-secondary degree. Um, uh, pursuit and attainment of youth with foster care experience. But from the data that we have, we do know that there's there's a large gap um, between post-secondary completion for youth with foster care experience and those both in the general population as well as other uh, marginalized groups such as um, first-generation students um, and things like that. Uh, next slide. 
So um, we know that even though youth and care experience a, a host of barriers to post-secondary um, success, we know we also know from research that most youth and care want to go to college, want, want to pursue a post-secondary degree, um, and, and expect to be able to do that, as they well should. Um, and so we, all, we know from uh, the little bit of research that's tracked youth and care um, through post-secondary completion that um, completing higher ed does help close some of the income gaps, uh, employment and income gaps that we see between youth with foster care experience and, and their general population peers, in addition to other, uh, other benefits. Next slide. So there are quite a few obstacles, um, and, and again, a lot of these were captured in the word cloud that we were just looking at, that, that, stand, that, that, make, that can make it really hard for youth in care um, to, to um, access and achieve higher education, as was reflected in the word cloud. Um, supportive adults, having those people in your life that are consistent, um, uh, caring adults that know about that post-secondary process. Um, this piece around financial resources. So there's the issue of there not being enough financial resources, but also if there are resources, knowing about them and accessing them and doing that whole navigation of those complicated processes. The issue around a uh, lack of post-secondary preparation. It can be really hard to be ready to go to college if you've been in eight different placements while you've been in high school and, and bounced around to multiple different um, to different uh, schools. So those are just some of the barriers and challenges that you think care face as they're per pursuing post-secondary ed or preparing for that. And there are actually quite a few programs out there that aim to support youth in care and um, pursuing higher ed, but there's not a lot of evidence of effectiveness, and we know that we're, we're not being successful as a field in closing that gap between um, post-secondary achievement of youth in care and, and other youth uh, in, the, in the general population or other marginalized youth. We need better evidence of what works in the field for helping youth in care be successful in higher ed. Next slide. Okay, so I know we're seeing a lot here, so I'm going to take a second and walk us through the Fostering Higher Ed um, program overview. Um, some of you have seen this before if you've been on our past web seminars. So Fostering Higher Ed is a two-year post-secondary access and retention program um, for youth in care. It starts off kind of later in the junior year of high school up or beyond, youth could have also finished high school or a GED program and are just kind of hanging out, haven't started pursuing post-secondary yet. So it's appropriate for any of those youth um, who haven't yet enrolled in post-secondary education. There's three primary components. Um, two of them are implemented by a professional educational advocate. The first component is the higher education goal planning and action procedure, um, which is just a really structured way to lead you through thinking through their higher ed goals and all the little steps that have to happen to achieve those goals. The second component is the top six potential pitfalls for higher ed curriculum. This is the curriculum we built based on um, research on what are some of those really common barriers to higher ed achievement for all youth, not only youth in care, but for all youth. And we built a curriculum to help um, um, help arm youth uh, with the knowledge of these of these potential pitfalls so they won't become challenges for them. Things like sleep, physical health, mental health and stress, financial challenges, relationships, and alcohol and drug, uh, drug use. And then our third component is mentoring. So we do a combination of one-on-one -on -one and group mentoring. We pair youth with a post-secondary experienced um, mentor. It can be somebody that they already know or someone from, from the community. Next slide. So our first full implementation of fostering higher ed was a, in a small pilot study in Southwest Washington. Um, we um, recruited 25 youth into the study. There were 13 youth randomized to the fostering higher ed group and another 12 randomized to the comparison condition. And really the goal here was to see, okay, um, how is this program working in terms of, uh, is, it, is it easy to implement? by those who are, who are implementing it? Do we need to change anything to make it work better in that sense? And so it's a, it was a very small pilot study. I'm gonna show you some of our findings from that study, but I just wanna point out sample size is really small. Our baseline groups um, weren't equivalent. So there's only so much we can say definitively about, um, about 
we, we can't yet say that it was that this program was effective, um, but we do have some uh, initial data to share from that pilot study. So uh, next slide. So the first I want to show you is, uh, has to do with quality of delivery and participant responsiveness. So how are you feeling about the program? Um, we actually have a lot more data on this. We're just showing some snippets today. But what we just a few things I want to share is that most youth did find fostering higher ed to be somewhat to very engaging, um, that it provided information that was important to them um, and was relevant to their lives. This was particularly true for the mentoring component. That was definitely the most popular component of the program. And something that's not shown here is we asked youth, how likely was it that you'd recommend fostering higher ed to a friend? And on a scale from one, which was definitely not recommend, to 10, which was definitely recommend, um, the student, the average score on that was eight. So youth would recommend um, fostering higher ed to a friend. Next slide. So a couple of outcomes from the pilot study, we looked at um, perceived barriers to higher education. So um, we asked youth about this before participating in the program and then after. And so for youth in the fostering higher ed group, their perceived barriers to education reduced by about 10%, while the comparison youth perceived barriers actually increased by about 14%. And then in terms of post-secondary preparation, um, we found that the youth in the fostering higher ed group really weren't doing much at all in terms of participating in post-secondary preparation tasks. This is a count of tasks, um, different things they had worked on prior to, in the year prior to the study. So their participation in post-secondary prep really went up over the course of participating in fostering higher ed. For our comparison youth, um, they were participating in more before the study started, and then it kind of stayed the same over the course so they didn't have that really big in increase in participation in post-secondary prep activities. Next slide. So we do have a bunch of recommendations, which we don't have, a, um, that have come from that first study, which we don't have time to go over today, but I just wanted to share a couple. Um, the first one is really just being ready to meet youth where they are, and I mean this in a few different ways. So one, physically, wherever youth are in the community, I'm um, making it as easy as possible for them to participate and um, to do um, the education planning and the mentoring and things like that, go to them. Also meeting youth where they're at in terms of other things, like bringing technology if they don't have access making it easy, take, helping reduce some of those barriers. Um, and another recommendation I'll share is um, just trying to link youth visits and, and what you're, when you're working with youth on other things they enjoy. So maybe they really enjoy art. So maybe you start off with an art activity when you're meeting with a young person and then transition to the work that has to do with, with higher ed. So some of the lessons that we learned here, and I'll talk a little bit about how, where you can find more information about what we found in this original study. Next, please. So um, following the pilot, the small pilot in Southwest Washington, we've now expanded and we're, are doing work um, in two additional sites. We're going to talk about a little bit about that next. So our two sites currently are Georgia and Iowa. We'll be, we'll be hearing um, from them in a couple of minutes. So essentially, um, these two sites in, in the Southwest Washington study, I was running the intervention and I had created it. I don't work um, in nonprofits or organizations that are youth serving. So really one big thing for this expansion study was to say, okay, what is this gonna look like in the real world um, when, when real organizations are implementing this? So we've trained Georgia and Iowa to implement fostering higher ed, and we've continued um, providing them ongoing technical assistance. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Um, each site, we are still researching to see, look at evidence of, of how it works, if it works and how it works. So each site has an inter has a fostering higher ed condition, and then they picked another part of the state to be the control group. And um, for this iteration of fostering higher ed, we've really bulked up our focus on racial equity. And Maddie will tell you about some of the work that we've been doing um, to, um, to address that um, in a second. Um, and in addition to looking at does this work in the real world, we are another long-term goal is if is if this pro if fostering higher ed does 
end up having um, showing to be effective, it'll be the one of the only evidence-based practices for supporting youth in care and achieving higher ed. And if we're if it's if we're able to get it into some of the clearinghouses, like the Title IV E Prevention Services Clearinghouse, it would then be eligible for federal funding for sites to be able to to get some funding to help implement it. So those are all goals that we're that we're working toward right now. Um, okay, so I'll hand it over to Maddie to tell us a little bit more about our focus on racial equity. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I had a quick speaker moment. Um, so we, when we went into this expansion site um, process, we really wanted to have some focus on racial equity and really uh, use this opportunity to um, build more evidence around the pathways that students that experience foster care um, who are also students of color take to and through post-secondary education. And so we did some work on the front end and then we're continuing to do some work throughout the process to increase that focus on racial equity. Um, so a few things that we did on the front end, we were really focused on ensuring that our sites were would be able to have good, strong data around identifying the racial and gender demographics of their older youth in particular. So we asked sites to identify those sources um, during the initial screening, and then we asked them to provide us with a racial and gender demographic breakdown of their older youth population within their state, and also within the focus area Areas that they would be implementing FHE. From there, Amy and her team provided a sampling guideline based on the racial and gender demographic data so that we could um, not just simple sample um, in proportion with the racial and gender breakdown, but over sample um, based on race and gender as well, based on um, oversampling our populations of color so that again, we could really do this evidence building around um, the pathways for students with experience in foster care um, who are students of color. Um, and then finally, we did some co-designing on the front end with some of our young people, our young leaders who are part of our Jim Casey site um, in Indiana, and we designed a, we co-designed an education equity workshop, and this education equity workshop really drew from their experiences as students with experience in foster care, and also their experiences as young people of color. And we integrated that into the very comprehensive training that all sites received um, prior, to, to our, prior to initiating and launching FHE in their sites. As I mentioned, we continue to have training and technical assistance that is focused on racial equity. So we provide this in a variety of ways. We have a focused um, one month, once a month training really focused on our all group TA. And we have included things like emergent learning table conversations, um, focuses on empathy and nurture gap discussions. So we can really understand um, the unique experiences that some of our students of color um, are currently experiencing, may have previously experienced, and also what they may experience as they start to move into post secondary education. We were fortunate enough to partner with our Georgia Youth Empowerment uh, group out of our Georgia Jim Casey site, who came in and provided two sessions for our group, really focused on how they implement authentic youth engagement. Um, they are some of the leaders among our network in authentic youth engagement, and led some really powerful discussions about how they approach um, different racial equity issues with the young people that they work with, and the lessons that they've learned um, in their work work with uh, you know, a whole variety of young people. And finally, we continue to have discussions about racial bias, understanding um, you know, the systemic inequities that we see in post-secondary education, and um, how those are going to disproportionately affect our students with experience in foster care, um, who are students of color as well. So these are all pieces that are ongoing. And in a little bit, you'll see a little bit more because we've been able to package some of this work um, in ways that you all have access to. And with that, I will turn it back over to Amy. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so just a little bit more about how we ended up working with the, the sites that we're working with. We, we started off with a screening process. Um, we provided a series of three web seminars, which some of you might have been a part of. Um, 
this was back in uh, fall of 2020, I believe. Um, and then, um, so sites that were interested in being pilot sites um, submitted a letter of interest and we went through a site readiness assessment with them and had some follow-up discussions to see if they were in a good place um, for implementing fostering higher ed. And then once we had enrolled our sites, um, we um, did training and a set, uh, technical assistance. So we did this for each site, identified educational advocates, mentor coordinators, and, and supervisors who would oversee this work. So um, each of these people did about eight hours of pre-training work. So a little bit of kind of background reading, some um, on their own motivational interviewing training. And then we had about 20 hours of initial training on uh, the fostering higher ed model, how to implement, um, et cetera. And then once, um, our, once the staff were trained, we are continuing to provide ongoing technical assistance. So there's two types of this. There's site-specific technical assistance um, that's twice per month, where we really look at, you know, how things are going, is are things moving along as planned, how's the mentoring going, how's the educational advocacy going, etc. And then we also have a once per month group technical assistance um, session where the sites come together. Um, we do some kind of team building work and with this and we um, have a larger focus on racial equity during the, the, team, the cross site or the group um, TA meetings. So we're still in the middle of this, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, next slide. Um, we're still in the middle of this current iterate, this multi-site expansion study, but we're already learning a lot as we go. So some of our um, early lessons learned, um, uh, we wanted to just share a few of those. And I, we've broken these down into preparing for fostering higher ed and then actually implementing fostering higher ed. So um, uh, some of the challenges that have come up or lessons learned um, and challenges had to do with things like getting referrals for youth participation. And that was a little bit more challenging than, than uh, sites had anticipated. And so we spent a lot of work working or a lot of time working together for coming up with strategies for identifying eligible youth, um, getting youth enrolled in, in the new programming, and it just became really clear that a really detailed multi-layered approach um, to getting youth um, involved in fostering higher ed um, was really necessary. Um, and kind of going beyond, for example, relying on uh, caseworker uh, referrals and things like that. Another um, piece that was uh, a little bit more challenging than anticipated had to do had to do with mentor recruitment, and so um, learn you know learnings around how mentor recruitment really takes time and um, needs to be started early, and also needs a multi layered approach for identifying interested mentors, kind of ushering them through that um, onboarding process, and so on. So um, in addition to lessons learned about preparing for fostering higher ed, we also have lessons learned on implementing. And so some of these, um, you'll, you'll see some, you'll hear me use some common terms around time um, and intentionality, I think are the big things that come out of this. Um, so it often takes time, a lot of time, and some really, and a lot of intentionality to get students engaged um, uh, in fostering higher ed work, both, um, both work with the educational advocate and the mentor. Um, uh, in one site, youth were already working with um, some of the providers that were part of fostering higher ed, and another site, these were brand new providers. So, uh, and, and the mentors were almost always new. So but taking time to build those relationships and really think, being intentional about that engagement um, was, a, was a lesson learned. Also, um, incorporating um, fostering higher ed content. Um, you know, we there's a lot of things that we cover in fostering higher ed. We have the um, educational um, goal planning. We have that curriculum. So particularly for the top six curriculum, um, when we want to build youth knowledge about challenges that could come up, a really good strategy ended up being um, really listening for when youth are bringing up some of these topics on their own and, and then incorporating some of the curriculum content. So for example, if a youth talks about financial challenges that they're having, oh, well, let's, you know what, let's take a, a little bit of time and go over the, the curriculum module on financial challenges. So finding good strategic times to build that content in was also a great lesson learned. Um, and finally, um, 
just kind of continuing to reflect on and practice that pursuit of racial equity, that that's an ongoing journey. It's not something that you can just check off a list. I mean, we knew this before, um, but in practice, really just um, internalizing that the the importance of keeping racial equity and, and what the youth in our program are experiencing um, at the forefront um, and continuing to explore ways that we can do that better has been a, an important lesson learned as well. Um, so those were some of our lessons learned um, from the study, but I also um, want to give now kind of pass it over to some of our colleagues in Georgia and Iowa to share some of their own experiences, some of their own lessons learned as part of this project. So I'll pass it back to Maddie to introduce our next piece. Yes, thank you. So we have a recording um, from two of our leads from our sites, one from Georgia, one from um, Iowa, and I believe we're going to be able to go ahead and show that now. Hi, Amina and Claire. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we are having this opportunity to just capture a little bit of your insight so that we can share it with folks during our web seminar on FHE. So I would love to start out with you, Amina, and ask what was it like starting out with FHE? What kind of things were important to have in place or what do you wish you had in place? Thank you so much, Maddie. Uh, those are great questions. I would say when starting out with FHE, it's been very exciting. Um, we support young people in foster care with education, so it's a great fit with what we're already working on. We love seeing young people be successful in education and in life in general. And so we're always thinking of ways, creative ways, in which we can encourage and empower young people along their educational journey. We're also excited to partner and collaborate with Washington State University and, of course, Casey Foundation in these efforts. Now, I will say some of the things that are important to have in place um, is really knowledge and structure, specifically around recruitment. So specifically to youth recruitment and mentor recruitment. Some of the things that we wish we would have had <laughs> are more experienced with recruiting and working with community mentors. Also, having an existing mentor pool to pull from and having an idea of the follow-up needed with things like administrative tasks, trainings, keeping mentors and potential mentors involved over time, and really how to pique interest among existing networks. Thank you so much. That's uh, just such a comprehensive answer and really helps to kind of flesh out all of the things that people need to consider when taking on this kind of work. I'm curious, you know, you said that this work is a really good fit um, because you're already working around education for young people with experience in foster care. I'm curious how the FHE work is different than other types of work you've done around youth engagement and education support. Well, I'll certainly say that it's different in that we learned about a couple things that we were new to. So motivational interviewing for sure, um, of course, the pitfalls curriculum. And although we have been doing some similar work, the blueprint of motivational interviewing and the format of the pitfalls curriculum was different in learning and absorbing the information to then go out and use. So I would say that this has truly been an opportunity to stretch a bit for us, incorporate different ideas, tasks, and even terminology into the work. Wonderful. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of the motivational interviewing, so I'm glad that that has, you know, been another tool that you all can add to your tool belt. Thank you so much, Amina. So Thank Claire, you. I want to go to you. Um, what are some early challenges that you experienced engaging students in FHE? And what did you do to overcome those challenges? Um, well, as uh, Mina mentioned, we had the um, six um, pitfall, potential pitfalls. They're not considered something that every um, student in the curriculum will be working on or with, but it's just information that you're giving them um, rather than something that you're enforcing upon them. So with the pitfalls, um, they are sleep 
challenge, financial challenge, relationship challenges, um, physical health, mental health, and then alcohol and drug drug use. Um, for those pitfalls, a lot of the time, youth would be um, centered around, I can only fit you and what we're going to work on into a specific time frame because I've got to go to work or I've got to go to school and I just got off school and I need to go to work. And so in the beginning, we struggled a little bit with how can we bring up something that could possibly be um, a conversation that might not be something they want to talk about. And so I kind of worked my way through delivering the curriculum to them by weaving it into the conversation naturally. So if it was, you know, tell me about your week and they said, I'm having trouble with my biological mom, I'm just not getting along with her, but I want to repair that relationship. And you can go through the relationship pitfall challenge and it's all done very straightforward step by step. And you have to think of it as how can I weave this step by step curriculum into a natural conversation um and it's very easy and very plausible to do if you're listening and using motivational interviewing techniques and responding in that manner um you can have a conversation and use the curriculum for the pitfalls in order to help that youth possibly set up a goal for themselves where they have a part of the goal to work on and you might have a part to work on um if it's something that they're interested in doing otherwise it's just a, a nice way to give them information um just to think about in the future that's great i mean i know you've done a lot of really incredible work uh with your students and working through all those pitfalls is definitely not easy but i know over the last gosh year and a half um you've really made uh some incredible strides with your students i would love to hear how you've centered racial equity in the fha work and um, how the focus on racial equity has really impacted your engagement with students. Um, I think that for me, being someone that is working with a lot of youth of color, that I have had to learn that I have biases that are not known to me. And we learned a lot about that through working with you, Maddie, that we all have um, biases in our lives that we're not aware of. And so for me, it became that the conversations that I was having with youth were not about me or anything that I needed to project upon them, but about being a good listener and then being someone that was able to recognize that their needs were not going to be the same as someone else's needs. Um, some examples would be I had a, a student who very early on when meeting her told me that a foster family that she had been with had cut her braids off because they didn't know how to take care of black girl hair and so they just decided to cut them off and she was left with very short hair and so now as a teenager she's very particular about her hair and she will not back down from spending a lot of money on hair and so rather than being like that's a silly frivolous thing for you to spend money on why are you spending so much money every month on your hair it's how can we budget your hair and you attaining the kind of braids you want or the kind of styles you want that might be more expensive how can we budget that into your life or maybe move to a different stylist that can give you a more sustainable style that lasts longer so it's not about inserting what i think is right which would be financial security it's how can we change the way that we're looking at it to fit what her needs are and her needs are that her hair is important to her um mm -hmm. so for me it's not inserting i statements it's being a better listener and being curious about who they are so if i'm curious about a story that you're going to tell me about your um Polynesian and Micronesian baseball tournament that comes here to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I'm going to be all in and I want to know all about it um, because it's something that I want to find out more about. And then I'm invested more in them and what they have to teach me. That's awesome. I really love how, you know, you have taken this on and really um, used it as a way to engage with young people and really center the work that you're doing around them and around what they are looking to you know pursue as their goals what's important for them that's wonderful thank you both so much it was great to hear from you and we'll look forward to uh hearing more during our q a section all right thank you everybody
Wonderful. So as you heard, we will uh, have Amina and Claire with us for our Q&A section, which is coming up. We have one more section. So um, I just would encourage you to put your questions, um, comments maybe that you have in the Q&A uh, so that we can um, you know, answer those questions for you. We would love to you know, be as useful as we can through the rest of the time that we have with you all today. Okay. So a couple last things, we're going to share about some resources, because as much as, you know, all of this learning, I'm sure, is very generative for you as you're thinking about supporting your students um, with experience in foster care, wherever you are, we do want to let you know that we have done our best to kind of curate and package some of the learning that we've had thus far. So uh, many of you may be familiar with the Jim Casey Initiative Exchange. If you're not, don't worry, we will send you a link so that you can set up your own account after this recording. Um, so do be sure that you look for that email that will come out. Uh, it'll have lots of great information. So we've organized our toolkit in a variety of ways. You can see the topics that are included. And some of you may be familiar with our previous um, toolkit on the exchange. This is an updated and revamped toolkit. Uh, so we're really excited to be able to share it with you all. And as you can see here, um, we have on the left side of the screen, a very, very small um, overview of what that toolkit looks like. We will be adding this recording to the toolkit. So if you missed a part or you wanna share this recording with someone you know, um, you can check that out there. You can also watch the first three web seminars that we had um, as we were building up to the Jim Casey expansion of FHE. Um, of course, we will always have data on here, research articles. Um, we do know that there will be another research article from Amy coming, hopefully in the next few months, so we'll be sure to add that up, um, on here. And we've also included some different pieces of information that we've curated, um, resources both that we have developed, some of those things that I mentioned around the racial equity resources, um, and then some other pieces just from different uh, places and sources within the Jim Casey Initiative Network. So you can see um, my face with my lovely colleagues. This is an image at the top there uh, from our um, training that we did. And so if you were curious about the racial equity and education training that we used as part of the training for uh, to launch FHE, you can actually watch that training there. You can share it with other folks. Um, we have data. A lot of this data comes from our, from our Opportunity Passport Participant Survey data. And, you know, it's really important that we make that data available to you so that you can understand the trend lines and the experiences the young people in Jim Casey sites are having. And then we also have just additional information about the fostering higher education pilot and um, the model and all of those good things. So if you want to dig in deeper, um, deeper than what we were able to present today, all of that and more is available to you on the Jim Casey Initiative Exchange. And with that, let's jump into some Q&A time. And it looks like we might have a couple questions. So I'm seeing a question here from Rick. Rick asks, I'm curious how much of a barrier it might be for your youth who have had their legal connections to birth parents terminated. Is that a concern of many youth? For example, does it affect their obtaining financial aid or driver's licenses? If so, how do you address that? Amy, do you want to jump in and share a little bit? And then I'll welcome Amina and Claire. You guys can pop yourself on camera and join us as well. I'm sure. So I would actually be interested in hearing if this has come up for, oh, maybe Claire, I know you work with quite a few youth, if this issue around, um, if this issue that Rick is bringing up, has that been something that you've worked on with youth? I have not had any youth that have had a barrier trying to reconnect with a bio parent, but I have helped quite a few fill out financial aid FAFSA information. Um, there are sections on FAFSA that say, um, do you want to answer questions about your parents? You can simply say, no, I do not want to answer questions about my parents because normally on FAFSA, um, it would ask for your parents' tax information, where they're living, that kind of stuff. And you can simply say, no, I don't want to answer questions. Um, I've not had any issues with a youth getting financial aid. Um, 
as far as the ID section, I did have an issue with a youth whose biological father would not give her her birth certificate. Um, and she was in care at the time. And so I think that her DHS, um, that's what we call child services here in Iowa, her DHS caseworker and her foster parents both worked to, to get a copy of that birth certificate um, so that she could get an ID and all of that. So she kind of lucked out in that area. But as far as finding information about your bio parents, um, in case you wanted to reconnect and have that kind of relationship, I haven't had any issues with that so far. Um, but I do know that there are people in most areas that will help a youth fill out the FAFSA forms, and then you can answer, no, I don't want to answer questions about my parents, and you're good to go. Mina, have you um, run into any of these issues with students that you've worked with? No, not really. Um, we have a team that helps out with FAFSA, um, and then also our young people are connected to essentially their IOP, so independent living um, specialists as well to help them with all things um, post-secondary. Um, in addition, um, there's a internal team with DHS that helps with all of the documents that are needed. So the birth certificate, everything that they would need as far as um, ID. And then we also can help them with that. And actually the state of Georgia has um, a specific policy around helping young people in foster care obtain their IDs as well. And which actually made it easier um, for young people to obtain their IDs. That's great. Yeah, there is. Um, so having been what they will call a ward of the court or in foster care um, on or after your 13th birthday is a classified status on the FAFSA that allows young people to be able to skip over having to provide financial information from their um, biological parents or guardians. So um, that is something important to know. Okay, we have another question that asks, do you have any knowledge or ideas for how to implement peer support as a service to improve post-secondary outcomes for young people? I can contribute a little bit to this one. I, I can start us off. Um, so in fostering higher ed, we don't specifically do like peer mentoring um, or near peer mentoring. Um, and there, I think there's been a little bit of difference um, kind of differences in in terms of research around near peer mentoring and how it can it can be a, a really positive experience it can also be um there can also be problems associated for example if if the nears or near peers or near peers are still struggling a lot with their own with their own traumas and things like that then then there there can be some potential backfiring to to peer or near peer work what what we do in fostering our higher ed though that gets a peer support is our, for our youth um, in this in the program, we pair them with a mentor to do one on one work, but we also bring youth and mentors together into group mentoring so they can meet other youth with similar foster care, you know, having also having foster care experience um, so they can build their social network and see, oh, yeah, you know, there are other youth out there who have had had a hard time like I have and they're pursuing higher ed. Um, so that's how we incorporate a little bit of that peer support is through our, our group activities um, with mentors. So they build their social networks, not only with youth with foster care experience, but also other adults um, that are po post-secondary experience. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? I was just going to say the same thing that with the group mentoring meetings that we have, um, I've noticed that a lot of the youth will gravitate to each other. So if they're with their mentor, um, they might try to sit near someone that they feel like, oh, that's someone that I could have share a similar vibe with. Or if their mentor hasn't come, but they still came because they were interested in whatever the topic was that we were talking about. Um, the last one that I did a couple of weekends ago, um, I had a youth who came with her mentor and then another youth who came with her son and my, my mentee that came with her mentor was just like, sit with us and like welcomed her into the fold and they got to know each other and you know, exchange numbers and I'm sure they'll Snapchat and that kind of thing. But normally what happens is they become 
more Snapchat buddies where they'll talk to each other online and not see each other as much in person until they start, I'm guessing that post-secondary part. So everyone that I have that's going into post-secondary um, right now is starting next Monday. And so I think a lot of them will reconnect through, we're finally going to school at the same school or living um, what is considered on campus here for our community college and that they'll reconnect that way. Um, but the, the group mentoring is really the only area that I've seen, you know, youth that have been in care meeting up and getting to hang out other than AMP, which is our other option is, um, I'm pretty sure AMP is nationwide, but that is where once a month there's a group activity and there's an AMP um, coordinator that will have anyone that's a youth, I want to say between 13 and 21, um, that can come and they'll provide a meal and they'll do some sort of activity. Sometimes they take them to baseball games, things like that. And so they get a lot of, it's kind of neat because then the older youth that have kind of been through things can be mentors to the younger youth that are coming into it. Um, and the younger youth can kind of learn by example. So that's the only other one that I can think of. I don't know if Amina has something like that in Georgia or not. We do. We have something called Georgia Empowerment. And so we have a state full of tribes that go out and support <laughs> our young people um, as far as peer mentoring, support activities. Um, one of the things that we learned was um, sometimes it's really about the messenger, right? So if a young person hears from another young person who's a little older, who may have transitioned through the system, who may have started life, um, you know, a little bit ahead of them, it can really reach back and help lift them up, share stories, success stories, stories of growth. It can walk them through certain things. They can sit down and have a meal with them and break bread with them. They can do activities together and they can really walk hand in hand through that mentorship and that peer to peer uh, support relationship. So Georgia Empowerment has been amazing in connecting young people all across the state together through our tribes um, for young people, current and former foster youth that come together to support each other. And they really do a lot of great work with, with peer support. And um, sometimes our young people can hear better, hear the message better from other young people who of course have walked the walk uh, prior to them other than some of our adult supporters. And so we lean on that because that's a significant resource and help and support to us. Wonderful. So we have just a couple more minutes and we have one last question. Cinda asks, um, what has helped to, what has been the most helpful in guiding a youth around the mindset of college is out of reach for me to I can do this, or uh, they put it another way, going from a survival mindset to future possibilities and plans. So would love to hear just, you know, quick thoughts. Claire, Amina, anything that you want to share, and then we'll close out. Um, mine is always, we have to make sure that your basic needs are met because you will not be able to focus on college or any type of learning if you cannot find housing you're struggling to pay off some sort of debt or bill. Um, and so my initiative is always, we must focus on your basic needs. We're gonna do one step at a time instead of, well, we gotta do basic needs and then we gotta rush you into school when you might not even be stable enough to focus on it. I don't want anyone to um, commit to something that big and then end up having to drop out because their basic needs were not being met. So we, I work with their aftercare team to make sure that housing secure, um, that they have a, some sort of income that will help pay for bills and food and that kind of thing. And then it's like, okay, now we can work on, um, if you need to get your GED, we can work on that. Or if it's going into some sort of college, we can start those steps, but always making sure that their mental health is good physical health, all of those things, because otherwise they will not reap the rewards of success. Thanks. I mean, we are at time, but if you have one more quick nugget, I'd love to hear it. Yes, I love this question. So let me just tag on to what Claire said. In addition to the basic needs, 
For us, we have learned it is critical that our young people have hope and they have exposure, right? So if our young people have the hope that they can do something different so that they can transition out of that survival mode, how can they do that? They have to see it, right? And for the exposure, it's really walking them through um, the places, the things, building on their strengths, right? And using that as a, a guide for them, right? For whatever that they're interested in. And certainly for us, that's one of the key things because when, when, you, when you see that spark, right? When they have that exposure, their minds are sparked and they say, oh, okay, I, well, I can do this. I can try that. And then you take them out in, into the community and they speak with people who are doing those things, preferably people who look like them, preferably people who are supportive to them and what their interests are. So I would say hope and exposure have really helped to transition our young people out of that survival mode into, I can absolutely do this. Thank you so much. We will leave it there with taking care of basic needs, creating those relationships, hope, and exposure. Thank you all so much for attending our webinar today. A recording of this will be available at the toolkit that we mentioned previously on the Jim Casey Exchange. Please look for the email with all sorts of information, and we look forward to staying in touch with you and sharing more as we continue to develop the Fostering Higher Education Pilot. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.